For today's video, we are going to move on to the next topic in our study of P versus NP. Now that we know what P is and, what we, and we know what NP is, we're going to look at a new tool which is called a reduction. We've actually seen a few examples of these already. And all that a reduction means is you're taking one problem, at specifically any algorithm for one problem, and solving another one. And why is that important? Well, what's, what really matters here is that we're going to be doing reductions between problems for which we don't have any good algorithms for either one. So it's going to be like taking one problem, which is totally unsolvable by any feasible way, and thinking about another problem, which is also totally unsolvable in any feasible way, and saying that we could use any algorithm for this one to solve that one. And what that does is it allows us to compare the difficulty of two different problems. So it's kind of like saying um, there's these, uh, you know, I don't have a Ferrari and I don't have a Mack truck, but I know that everything I could carry in the Ferrari, I could carry just as easily in the Mack truck. I don't, I don't know if that's a, if that's a good example, but it's saying like, here's two things that I, I don't have a good algorithm for either one, but this, if I had an algorithm for this one, it could solve this other problem. And shows that, that shows that like this, um, this problem is like more powerful or more difficult than this other one. And that's, that's basically what this is saying here. So a reduction, and I always get confused. It, to me, like there's no good way to remember. You just have to kind of memorize what it means from which one to which one. But a reduction from problem A to problem B is starting with problem A and using problem B as to solve it. Um, so solving any input for problem A using any algorithm for problem B. And that shows us that B is at least as difficult as A. So we would write like A kind of less than or equal to B in terms of difficulty. And that's what, um, with the small notation, the small difference will we'll actually use this kind of notation. So whenever we're talking about a reduction from A to B, we're going to start with the input for A and then try to write an algorithm which does, you know, it's allowed to do some other stuff, but it's going to call B as like a subroutine and then finally come up with a solution to problem A. So we're, we're solving A using B. Let's see an example. This first example is not between two problems that are like totally intractable, but between two problems which are tractable, but it's it's uh, maybe an interesting way to see the idea of what a reduction is. Um, and so we're actually going to be able to show that these two problems of multiplying two matrices and of squaring one matrix, that they are equivalent to each other, um, to within constant factors. And so how would we do that? Usually when we're talking about these reduction between two problems, there's one direction where it's kind of like obvious or easier. So think about this. If we have matrix multiplication algorithm and we have a matrix squaring algorithm, which one is kind of obviously seems to be more powerful or more general? It's the matrix multiplication one. So that means that we can, um, the easy reduction is going to be saying that matrix squaring reduces to matrix mall. And so how are we going to do that? We have to start with an input for matrix squaring. So given A, how would we solve the problem of computing A squared by using matrix mall? We just compute um, matrix mall of A times itself. Done. Okay, so this is just saying that if all we knew how to do was multiply matrices, then we could definitely square a matrix by just multiplying it by itself. Maybe you have to make a copy of it and then you get to multiply it by itself. Okay, so that one is kind of, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit straightforward uh, saying, yeah, it seems definitely like that makes sense. What's the, and then there's usually a harder direction. If we're really trying to show these equivalent, the, the hard challenge is, wait, how would we show that it works the other way? So how would we show that matrix multiplication reduces to matrix squaring? So think about what this means. This means that we have to use the matrix squaring algorithm in order to solve a matrix multiplication problem. 
So to start out, we can definitely say that our input is going to be an input for matrix mall. So the problem we're reducing from. Um, so it's going to be two matrices A and B. And now somehow I have to figure out how I can square a matrix in order to multiply A times B. It's not obvious how you do this. It wasn't obvious to me. I, I remember when I first saw this challenge, uh, when I was in grad school, I was like, that doesn't seem possible, but it is possible. Um, so if you remember, we can build like a larger matrix um, that's in this case, is gonna be like a 2N by 2N matrix where we put smaller matrices inside it. So that's uh, the same thing that we did like for Strassen's algorithm where we said, take this original matrix and we're gonna split it up into like splitting the rows in half and the columns in half into four smaller matrices of each size, like N over two by N over two. So now we're kind of doing the same thing, but in reverse. And I'm gonna put matrix A up here and matrix B up here. And then what I'm gonna fill in in the rest is just a whole bunch of zeros. So I have like N squared zeros in the top left, N squared zeros in the bottom right, and then whatever the ma entries of matrix A are up here and then whatever the ma entries of matrix B are down here. So it's a two N by two N matrix. It's a little bit larger than the beginning. And what happens when I square that? So I'm gonna feed that into the matrix square algorithm. And what does that give me? Well, um, it's gonna give me another 2n by 2n matrix, and we can think of it block by block. So what's going to be in the top left entry is going to be 0 times 0 plus going along kind of the first row in the first column, it's going to be a times b. So this is just going to be a times b up here. Um, on the diagonals is going to be kind of 0 times a plus b plus a times 0. So this is 0. Uh, down here is going to be um, zero times B plus B times zero. So that's zero. And on the bottom right is actually going to be B times A, which interestingly for matrices, A times B is not always equal to B times A. But the point is that right up here, I have the answer that I originally wanted. So then this becomes my output. And that's how I can solve matrix multiplication with matrix squaring. So I wouldn't expect you to come up with that. Uh, I remember when I first saw this, I could not come up with this, but I, I thought it was, I always thought it was super cool and it stuck with me um, that if we're able to square a matrix, then you're also able to multiply two matrices um, and you just have to square a matrix that's twice as large in the dimension. And so what this shows is that we can go a reduction in both ways. So we can use any matrix multiplication algorithm. Definitely we can use that to square a matrix by just making a copy. But we can also use any matrix squaring algorithm to solve the matrix multiplication problem. And so that means that these two problems have the same inherent difficulty. Um, any algorithm for one can, can give you an algorithm the same big O running time for the other one. And so by this pair of reductions, without looking at, you know, we didn't talk about Strassen's algorithm in particular or like Coppersmith Winograd improvement of that one or anything else. What we know is that the big O running time of these two problems is always going to be the same because you can solve either problem with the other one. And so that's the kind of relationship that we're looking for with now with harder problems. So this is with problems which we actually know are both in polynomial time. We know how to solve them. So now we're going to apply the same kind of ideas to problems that are actually not known to be in polynomial time, but still by doing this kind of reductions of solving one problem with another, then we can compare the difficulty and try to think about, you know, when we have these super hard problems that we don't know how to solve, how can we say that they're equivalent anyway? And so what we're ultimately going to be interested in, this is an example of a linear time reduction because it's just using the other instance, it's calling the other algorithm one time on an input, which is either the same size or like twice as large or something. Um, but in general, what we're going to be worried about is polynomial time reductions. And so um, what, I'll get into the, the details here, but you're, so you're solving A with problem B. So what you're worried about is like how many times you call B. So how many times you have to call that subroutine? Um, how big are the inputs to be? Right, so you can't, 
it wouldn't be a polynomial time reduction if you said, oh yeah, I can solve problem A with problem B, I just have to make this like exponentially large thing to feed it in. That wouldn't really make sense as a polynomial time reduction. And then there's also might always be some extra work, like some stuff, you know, usually this is going to be loops or lookups um, or creating inputs for B. But it's just like other stuff that doesn't have to do with calling B. It's just other work, and that also needs to be polynomial time. So if everything is polynomial here, the number of times we call the other algorithm, how big are the how much bigger are the inputs that we give it and how much extra work we do, then we have a polynomial time reduction. And this is the formal notation we use, which is just a less than or equal to sign with P. And so think of this as being a comparison of difficulty. This means that, okay, we would say that A is polynomial time reducible to B. So we're gonna show a polynomial time reduction from A to B. And what that means is th this, this notation of the less than or equal sign is meaningful. It tells us that B is at least as hard as A. So I'll even write that down. B is at least as hard as A. Okay, and that's the whole point of this is to compare the inherent difficulty of problems. So let's look at a couple examples. Um, we're gonna define a couple new problems here, and then we're gonna look at examples of some a couple reductions. And we'll see much more examples of reductions also in the coming classes. So the first problem here is called hit set. Um, the maximum hitting set. So what we have is a bunch of sets. Um, so we have a bunch of sets here. And then is there another set H of size K that contains at least one thing from each of these um, sets SI. So what we're trying to do is kind of like pick some elements that's going to represent all these groups, right? So if you know that you want on your, you, you're trying to like, make a good team um, to solve your next problem set. So you know you need someone that's organized. Okay, so make a set of all the people that are organized. And then you need uh, someone, you're gonna need someone that's really good with like, with mathematical ideas. So S2 is gonna be the people that are good with mathematical ideas. And then you need somebody that's really good at like thinking out of the box, thinking creatively. Okay, that's S3. And S4 is gonna be the people that just like have a lot of time. You know they're gonna put a bunch of time into it in the middle of the night, that's S4. And now you wanna to try to find a small group of people that like hits every one of those categories. So maybe there's just one person that would fit all those categories. You know, they're hardworking, they're good at math, and they have a lot of time on their hands, um, and they're organized. Okay, then that's great, but maybe you need two people. You know, one person has a few of the characteristics, another person has a few of the other characteristics. So the minimum hitting set problem is saying, can I come up with a, set of elements that's going to hit every one of these subsets, every one of these like characteristics, and have size at most k. So the input size here is going to be all of the input sets L. So it's going to be, um, so the list L, so it's going to be M plus N, where N is the total size of all S is, of all the S sets S. And uh, so we're just gonna encode that as a list of sets. Um, plus we could say log of K, but we know that K will always be less than um, M. Uh, so that's, that's fine, right? Because we could always just like pick the first person from each group and that would have size M. So um, it would never make sense for K to be larger than that. Okay, so you can think, but that seems like a hard problem. Um, and again, it's, you should be able to convince yourself, why is this an NP problem, right? How would you check that the answer to this is yes? How would you confirm that you actually have a hitting set? Okay, and then ham cycle, the ham cycle problem, it's really Hamiltonian cycle. We talked about this with traveling salesman problem. So it's kind of like um, an unweighted traveling salesman problem. And it's just saying, is there a way to cycle through all the nodes of a graph um, without repeating anything? So the input size is just the size of the graph, which is at most n squared, if we use an adjacency matrix. Um, okay, so first let's talk, think about this hitting set problem. And what we wanna do is a reduction from the vertex cover problem. So this is saying, does there exist a vertex cover of size at most k? So this is kind of the inputs are g and k. And the hitting set problem, where we're saying, does there exist a hitting set of size at most k? So the inputs here are, all the sets S 
and an integer k. So how are we going to do this kind of reduction? What we want to think about is we're going to start with the, we're trying to solve the vertex cover problem. So the input is a graph G and an integer K. And we're trying to ask if G has a vertex cover with size of most K. So now we have to think about what that means and how it can relate to the hitting set problem. So um, in this case, it's, what we what you realize if you start to think about this is that hitting set is really just a, a generalization of vertex cover um, and so for vertex cover what we're trying to find is a set of vertices that touches all the edges so that means for all the edges in this graph at least one of those verte vertices has to be covered okay so what does that mean in terms of hitting set is well we're just going to make the the sets for hitting set be the edges so i'm going to say um for each edge like u, i, v, i in the graph G, we have to create the input for the hitting set problem. So we're going to define S, i equals just the set of those two vertices, u, i, and v, i. Oh, sorry, it should be a set. And now, what we're asking for is a set of vertices to cover all the edges. That's the same as a hitting set that you know has to cover all of these sets, that has to hit every one of these sets. So we want a set of the vertices, which is going to be a set of elements out of all these sets that's going to touch every one. It's really the same thing. So the vertex cover is really the same as the hitting set problem if we restrict to sets of size 2. So then what I'll say is that we'll return um, the result from calling hitting set with all of the sets like S1, S2 up to Sm and the same value of k. So asking if there's a vertex cover of size of most k is the same as asking for a hitting set of size of most k if we define each set for hit set to be just a pair of, of vertices that forms an edge. And so this is, you have to see that connection. So there's, you definitely have to understand well what both problems are. And this probably seemed a little bit fast because I, I literally just told you what hitting set meant. And then I right away did this reduction. So that's okay if this felt a little fast, but I want to emphasize that this is an example of what we would consider, consider kind of an easy reduction because once you see that connection, you see that hitting set is just a straight generalization of vertex cover. If we just translate the edges into sets. So, we couldn't do this reduction so easily in the other way, however, because for hitting set, the sets don't have to be just size two. So if we restrict it just size two sets, then they're the same problem. But in general, it seems like hitting set is can solve more things because it doesn't have to restrict itself just to sets of size two. So that's why we have a reduction. What we're saying is that hitting set is polynomial time reducible from vertex cover. So hitting set is kind of a little potentially more difficult. Anything I could use to solve hitting set, I could also use to solve vertex cover. Okay, let's look at another example. So this is a ham cycle problem that we just talked about. Um, so I always think about like the ham being passed around the table. And the challenge is to try to think about how can you pass the ham around the table to all these people that are sitting there without going over everything twice. So if like we start at A, might as well start with A. We might like go down here and like already we're in trouble because now I can't go to L, I'll get trapped, but if I go up here, then I'll, I'll miss out on L, and now I'm like trapped over here. The ham is trapped. It has to go pass through some other hands. Um, so that's the, that's the ham cycle problem. And actually, there is a Hamiltonian cycle in this graph. Uh, if you want to pause the video, you can see if you can figure out what it is. And I will pause and then draw it. So I think it goes down like this. And then up here and down and back to A. So there might be another Hamiltonian cycle as well, but this one definitely works. It goes through every node exactly once and doesn't, um, yeah, doesn't cross over every node and, and it hits everything. So that's a Hamiltonian cycle. It's kind of hard to find. I hope you paused and tried yourself. Uh, so now we want to think about how that problem reduces to the longest path problem, which we saw in class. So ham cycle, this, the input here is just a graph G. 
And for longest path, the input is a graph G and an integer K to say, does G contain a path of length at least K? So we're starting with this one. So we're starting just with the graph and we want to use we, we suppose that we know how to answer the long path question. Can we use that to solve the ham cycle problem? Well, if we look back to this example, um, the question is how can we relate this cycle that we're really interested in to a long path in the graph? And the answer is you can do it by removing any edge from this cycle. So let's imagine we removed this edge. So if we're going to remove the edge from A to H. So we know there's originally an edge from A to H. If we take it out, then this Hamiltonian cycle is really a length, uh, I guess, length k minus 1 cycle from a to h in the graph. I don't know why I said k minus 1. I meant to say n minus 1. Any, any path of length n minus 1 is going to have to touch every node, so it starts at a and ends with h. And then we can add back in this edge that we removed to get back from h to a, and that completes the cycle. So that, that works, but we have to, we have to like pick an edge that's actually part of the real Hamiltonian cycle. Right? If we picked this edge from A to B, then there, that wouldn't really tell us about the Hamiltonian cycle because there might not be any long path from A to B. Because, you know, so if we pick this one to remove first, that doesn't kind of answer the question for us. And so what we have to actually have to do is we have to try to remove every edge that's connected to A one at a time then try to find a long path and any of them works, that tells us that we can complete that to make a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, so the reduction now, based on that, the reduction is, is like this. So we start with G, start with input graph G. Now, what we're gonna do is pick a node A, or I'll call it U, I usually call the nodes U and V in G. And now for for every edge that touches that node, so u, v, in g, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to remove. So let g prime equals g with u, v, removed. So that's like taking that one edge out. And then I ask, I'm going to ask if there's a long path in g prime of length n minus 1. And if there is, then I return yes. OK, so that's what I'm going to do. And then at the end, um, if none of them worked, then I return no at the, at the end of the for loop. I think actually I should amend that the long path takes a pair of vertices besides just k, uh, takes a u and a v. And so this, this long path has to go from, um, yeah, from u to v in the graph. Right, because it, it's not any long path. I have to go from u to v, and then I connect it with that note, that edge that I removed from v back to u. Um, and so that tells us that I've tried every possibility. If I try every edge next to node u and none of them works, then that means that there must not be any Hamiltonian cycle on the whole graph. So again, back to the example, I'm going to start, I'm going to pick my node a as an arbitrary node. And I first try removing A, B, that edge, and I look for a long path from A to B. That might not exist, but that's fine. Then I try A to D and A to H, and one of them will definitely work if there is a Hamiltonian cycle in the whole path, in the, in the whole graph. Okay, so the, this example of reduction is more difficult. What makes this a more difficult reduction is that we have to call this multiple times, right? We have to call long path, um, like potentially n times, but only n times. But it, so it's a little bit more tricky. We have to like modify the original input. We have to call this multiple times and, and think about what that means. But at the end of the end of the day, it still works. It's still going to be a working um, polynomial time reduction from Hamiltonian cycle to long path. Meaning, any algorithm I have that'll solve the longest path problem can also be used to solve the Hamiltonian cycle problem in the same polynomial running time. OK, so what did we see today was we saw the idea of reductions and polynomial time reductions in particular. And we saw a few specific polynomial time reductions, like from vertex cover to hitting set and from ham cycle to long path. 
And what's important about these is that we're able to reason about the relative difficulty of these problems to say that long path is at least as difficult as ham cycle, even though nobody knows any fast algorithm to solve either of these problems. And that's a really useful tool. And we'll see some um, really powerful and surprising consequences of that in the next video.